I know some people don't understand it, but for me personally, it has just always, I mean, when you think about having a baby, you just envision it, having it vaginally. And that was just my dream. And just, I wanted to experience that and have that um, be part of one of, at least one of my birth stories. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for joining me in this special episode of Mom Talks with Krista. I hope you're having a great week so far. So this week, I wanted to reshare one of my favorite interviews that we did. It actually is one of our top viewed, top rated episodes. And I love it because it has a lot of heart, perseverance, and I think it just really encourages moms to go after what makes them happy and trust their gut with a lot of things. I think a lot of times, especially in with having a baby, you kind of listen to what's out there. You kind of listen to what people tell you is right or wrong or your doctor. When a lot of times we forget to trust our own gut and our own instinct and what we believe in and what we can do. So today's episode, we're going to reshare um, from Kara Swanson. She was on, I think, two years ago now, sharing her story about a VBAC after two C-sections, which yes, it's possible. So don't let, don't let anyone tell you it's not possible. It's very possible. She was told by many doctors not to do it. She was told by people not to do it, but she knew she wanted to have that vaginal birth and she did her research and she found a doctor that would do it. So if you're looking for some encouragement today, some motivation, just some inspiration on kind of taking your own, uh, taking your own journey and kind of finding what works best for you doing your own research. Then I highly encourage you to listen to this episode. Like I said, this was a top rated episode. People loved it because I think a lot of times people are told when you hear a no, you just go with the no, but she heard a no and she's like, someone out there will give me a yes. And so she had a very successful VBAC and it's just really cool to hear her story, how she went through with it, the research she did and so much more. But she also talks about saying no to taking glucola and again, doing her own research of seeing what she could do um, for gestational diabetes for that test. So it's just a really great interview. Last time we split up into two parts, but we're just going to throw it all together here today. So I hope you guys enjoy it. We've definitely made some changes to the show since then. So you might notice some kind of like old things in there, but um, I hope you guys enjoy it. Nevertheless, um, of course, stick around to the very end for our mom tales of the week. Uh, these are questions that we throw out to you guys every single week just to get your take on motherhood. So without further ado, please enjoy this previous episode with Kara Swanson. Thanks guys. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into this episode of Mom Talks with Krista. Today I have Kara Swanson, who is the founder of Life Well Lived. She creates gluten-free and clean eating recipes over on her website. But today she's talking all about her journey to have a VBAC after two C-sections. She had many doctors that told her no, but she did her research and she persisted and found that she was able to get what she wanted to. So check out this episode. Can't wait to see what you think. And just start by like telling us a little bit about you, um, your background, family, and what you do. So I'm Kara Swanson. Um, I have a blogger over at Life Well Lived. Um, it's kind of my nutrition company business. Um, I share a bunch of recipes, um, gluten-free recipes, healthier, you know, swaps and things like that, nutrition tips. I am married almost nine years this month, so that's fun. And then I have three kids. Um, London is seven, Eileen is four, and Shepard is 10 months. So they keep me busy. Um, we're kind of, we, my husband and I both work from home. Um, we both own our own businesses. So it's a little crazy, but it's fun and it kind of works for our family. Yeah. So like the reason I wanted to invite you on the show is because I, you know, if we were just talking about before I started recording was, you know, that we met like a couple of years ago at like mm -hmm. a Jenna Kutcher event, which anyone that hasn't heard of Jenna, Jenna Kutcher and they should yeah. definitely look her out because she's awesome. Yeah. But, and then I was scrolling and I saw your story about how you had two C-sections. So with your mm -hmm. two daughters and you were really committed and really wanted to have a VBAC. So you kind of shared your story. So 
To backtrack a little bit, so with your C-sections, were these something that were planned or how did these kind of come about in your birth story with your daughter? So my first one was with London um, almost seven, well, seven years ago, and that was not planned at all. I went in wanting like a natural birth, but I was also naive (laughs) to what birth was like and just how to like, I wasn't mentally prepared either, but I just wasn't progressing um, in my labor. And I just, I didn't even know either, like how to use my voice really then, like what I know now. And I just didn't even know the things to ask or look for, or, you know, questions to ask my doctor. They said, you know, it could be, and her heart rate was going down too with some contractions. So they said, you know, we can wait a little bit longer, um, but then it would be an emergency if, you know, she didn't come out within a certain amount of time. So we just decided, okay, let's just go ahead and do it as calmly as possible. So we'd had the C-section. Um, she ended up having her, the umbilical cord wrapped around her neck three times. Mm-hmm. They did say that if I would have had her vaginally, she probably wouldn't have survived. So I feel mm-hmm. like completely at peace with that C-section, even though it was very, it was actually more traumatic. Just with her, they had to whisk her off and make sure she was okay. And then I got an infection and was hospitalized afterwards. And, and so that one was just, it was traumatic. And so I, my next, um, when I got pregnant again with my second daughter, I was like, okay, I want a VBAC. I do not want to experience that C-section again. I actually had a different doctor because we had moved um, to a different state and I told them about my desire to have a VBAC and they said, okay, you know, that's fine. But at each appointment I was kind of like, and we're on course like to have a VBAC, right? Like we can do this. And they're like, yeah, some doctors, you kind of at that um, practice, you had to see different doctors, different doctors would kind of say different things. Some of them would be more encouraging than others, but more often I left just discouraged and like they really weren't supporting my my dream of having a VBAC but I again even four years ago I didn't know that I had a voice and I didn't know what questions or where to go to get the information that I needed or that I could even go to a different doctor and had I known that I would have done things differently we were still kind of on course to have a VBAC um, and then my last week because they would only let me go I think a week past my due date and they wouldn't they said they would would not um, induce me or anything like that. They said, you know, we're going to schedule the C-section because you're not, I wasn't dilated. I wasn't progressing or anything. They weren't going to give me any more time. So that was really emotional, you know, knowing that I, I felt like I didn't have a choice or any other options. So that one was scheduled, but I will say that it was a lot more peaceful and like mm-hmm. it was I still got to let the blood pulse, you know, the umbilical cord, you know, delayed the cutting of the cord. I got to do the skin to skin. So I knew that I could ask for those certain things. Again, more at peace um, with that, but it was still hard. And I knew with my next pregnancy that I was going to do everything that Mm -hmm. I knew that I could. Um, And I researched a lot and did a lot more fighting for myself and advocating for myself um, with my third one. Awesome. Yeah. Actually, I was going to like lead into my next point about what kind of then change between, you know, your second daughter and your son. And it sounds like the research and really just like the power behind it, knowing like you really want this. Yeah. Yeah. It was just a VBAC and natural birth is just, I know some people don't understand it, but for me personally, it has just always, I mean, when you think about having a baby, you just envision it, having it vaginally and that was just my dream and just I wanted to experience that and have that um, be part of one of at least one of my birth stories and so yeah when I found out that I was pregnant with Shepard I immediately hopped on the phone I called all the different OBGYNs and said hey I want to have a VBAC and at first they were like sure and then I was like well after two c-sections and they were like well no we don't do that And I was like, no, you know, no one in your office will make an exception. And they said, no. And I, I mean, I called, I don't even know how many, and I kept getting no, no, no's. And I, I called a midwife. I knew that they probably wouldn't take me, but I just called anyways. Um, and I'm glad I did because she was like, we can't take you, but, and, um, no one in, in the Des Moines area where I live, no one will do a VBAC after two C-sections. That's just kind of a policy that they have. They said, but in Iowa City, which is two hours away, they said that they do them. And I said, okay. So I hopped off the phone 
and I immediately called Iowa City, got a hold of the nurse, and she was just like, yeah, we do them all the time. Like, act like it was like no big deal. And I was just like, this is my place. Like, I am going there. And so that was really encouraging. And finally, I felt like, okay, like some hope, you know, that this was actually going to happen. That's awesome. That's like real, like determination. I, mean, <laughs> I think that's so good for everyone to hear is because mm. so many moms, I think, would have either given up or felt mm. like, oh, well, if, you know, these five places don't do it, then I, it's just fine. I shouldn't do it. Yeah. But I think it's awesome that you went with your initial goal and instinct that this is what I want to do. Yeah. And, and I even said happen. that too. Yeah. I said that to the midwife. I was like, when she told me, I was like, oh, she was like, honestly, she was so encouraging. And she was like, I, she's like, if it's important to you, she's like, you do it. And she was just like, it's not that big of a deal to drive two hours. She's like, people drive to a midwife. You know what I mean? You know, people drive here to see me, you know, she's like, it's, it's worth it if it's something that you want. And so that was just super encouraging to me to be like, okay, like this isn't crazy to drive, you know, just two hours one way. Um, yeah. So that's, um, that was really encouraging to hear from her. That's awesome. So, so once you kind of found out in Iowa city that there was doctors there that would do a VBAC after two C-sections. So what did, how did you go about then finding your specific doctor and kind of what told you that this was the right choice with your doctor? So I think I got super lucky in the fact that I, well, I just called and I said, you know, I want to make an appointment and they, um, put me with the doctor, um, Dr. Schaefer. And so she was my first doctor and I immediately like knew she was my doctor. She was like, like listen to me. She was so encouraging. I had the option to kind of see and kind of, you know, see if I wanted a different doctor, but we, my husband was with me and we were both just like, no, like this is the doctor for us. So yeah, I just fell in love with her right away. She still, I'm like, I want another baby just so I can like see her again. She's incredible. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So then I'm sure by that point you were like, this was meant to be like this. I need yeah. to do this. So you kind of mentioned like calling a midwife at first. Did you end up having like a midwife or a doula part of your procedure at all? I didn't. Um, you know, I, I thought about maybe having a midwife. I even called a couple and just you know, toyed with the idea, but when it came down to it, we just kind of felt like we didn't need one as much. But during labor, I was like, I wish I would have had one, <laughs> but it worked out. It worked out completely fine and how it should, you know, how it was meant to be. But yeah, yeah. I can see now like the benefit of having one for sure. <laughs> awesome. And so you kind of mentioned like you did a lot more research this time around. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else you had to do to kind of prepare for it differently or different things that maybe your doctor like told you that was different this time around because of, you know, having two section C-sections prior? I didn't do anything necessarily specific to prepare for the VBAC. I think it's super important, like to be staying healthy, you know, like with nutrition and exercise, because I know that's just good for you anyways, but just so that your body is prepared and also for recovery, it's going to help. I did a lot of like mindset stuff, I guess, and just visualizing having my, like the birth that I wanted and also just staying positive, especially the last couple of weeks of my pregnancy were like super, super hard. I got super sick. And so I just had to, I had to work a lot on like my mindset with it and, you know, not listening to the lies and the fears that were trying to come in um, and just trying to stay positive. Kind of like while you were going through this, did you have any, have any doubts or were you really good about kind of like blocking those doubts out and just keeping up? A positive mindset. No, I had a lot of doubts. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't fearful ever. So a lot of times why doctors won't, well, why doctors won't take, um, VBAC patients and especially they're nervous about the VBAC after two is that uterine eruption. And it's, it's so scary, obviously if that happens, but it's actually really, really quite low for it to actually happen. The percentage is like 0.02%. And so it's super low. Um, and so and there's also things like I would talk to my doctor, you know, there's things that they can see that would lead up to it. So mm -hmm. she was like, we'll be monitoring you um, the whole entire time to see if we see any of those markers, you know, that that might happen. So that I felt completely at peace about. It was just, I was honestly more fearful about the actual C-section itself mm -hmm. um, and just not getting to have 
a birth because in my mind, I felt like this was kind of like my last chance, you know, to try for a VBAC. Um, so that was more of what I struggled with just, um, wanting the actual VBAC and having that experience. You said the doctor, the doctor you had prior had dropped you because you wanted a VBAC after two C-sections and also because you weren't going to drink the glucola. So I thought this was so interesting while you talk about it on your Instagram. Can you explain a little bit about what glucola is for those of us that don't know and kind of your story with that? So glucola is the drink that you take um, to see if you have, what is it called? The diabetes. What is it called when uh, the- gestational diabetes? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so you take it, it's, you know, it's supposed to see different levels. They take your blood work after, and it's just a lot of toxins, a lot of dyes, um, and things that I don't personally drink or want, you know, not pregnant. And then I really don't want it, you know, with my baby inside me. I didn't know really about that with my first. And then with my second, I, I could drink the orange, like orange juice. And then with my third, I probably could have done the orange juice. I just thought jelly beans sounded more fun. <laughs> so, so I, you know, was, was saying like, you know, I wanted an alternative um, to the glucola. And that doctor was like, no, we won't do that. But my doctor in Iowa City was like, yeah, that's completely fine. That's not a big deal. Really what you have to do is, and I don't know the exact like grams or anything, but you, you want a certain amount of sugar in a certain amount of time, whatever the glucola is, whether it's 50 grams of sugar, then you have to eat 50 grams of either the orange juice or um, the jelly beans. So I just brought the bag of jelly beans. They asked me to just to bring the bag of jelly beans. They counted them out for me, gave them to me. And that was, that was my test, how I did it. So let's go to then kind of like your, your birth story a little bit. Um, so you had the successful be back and I'm mm-hmm. sure it was just like an amazing moment for you. So just like, mm-hmm. tell us a little bit about what that was like and um, how it all went down. It really was like just so magical and just a, literally a dream come true because I, I mean, for seven years, like I wanted this, you know? And so it was just the best experience. So the cool thing about my doctor too is, which a lot of times they won't um, induce for a VBAC, um, especially VBAC after two, but this doctor and this hospital would um, induce, which is really awesome um, because I wasn't progressing much and they could only do two things though. They can only give me some Pitocin and a cook catheter um, to help dilate. So that was encouraging. I went in to be induced um, at 6 a.m. and it And we had to wake up super early because it was a two-hour drive, but it was still worth it. Um, So I was in labor for a long time. Um, I wanted to go natural because I was trying to do everything that I could to make my VBAC successful. And I had read that sometimes, you know, getting an epidural could slow things down. And so I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go natural just so I could have everything lined up, you know, to have the perfect birth story. So I got Pitocin. They started me on a very low dose, some contraction, and then they decided to go ahead and put the cook catheter in. And that is like the catheter, but it has like a balloon and it, it gets bigger and then it dilates you. So it manually dilates you to a five or a six. And then it comes out because it's, it lost grip or whatever on you. And so we decided to go ahead and do that. And I was still, it was still natural. And I didn't know this at the time, but that like kicks, like starts like contractions right away and intense contractions because it's like doing it for you. So things got pretty intense, like super fast. We decided to go into the tub and I was laboring and I thought, I I mean, it was so incredibly painful and my contractions were like 10 to 15 seconds apart. So I like never really got a break. Um, And I was just having a hard time even like breathing, but I was trying my best to like breathe through them and moan through them. But my husband, we kind of joke now, but he says I was screaming through them. And at one point I did look over at him and he was at his like hands over his ears, like, cause I was so loud and I was like, so exhausted. Like I couldn't even do anything. You know what I mean? I'm like, we'll chat about that later. No, we (laughs) laugh about it. It's fine. The nurse was never like pressuring, but she was just like, I really think you'd benefit from an epidural. And my fear was just that I, it would slow labor down and that, you know, I wouldn't have a successful VBAC. Um, and my husband was like, Kara, I really think that, you know, you should. And I was like, let's just wait a little bit longer. Let's just wait. And then they were like, okay, let's go labor by the bed on a medicine ball. As soon as I got out of the tub, like 
it got even worse. Like I couldn't even like stand. So they like, you know, kind of like carried me to over. And I was just like, I can't even, I couldn't even catch my breath because the contractions were so on top of each other. And I was just like, let's just like, let's do it. Like with tears running down my face, I'm like, let's just get the epidural. If this lasts another hour, like I think like I'm going to die from like these contractions. The doctor came in and checked me after I got the epidural and I had it dilated like any. And I was like, that was like five, six hours of like hardcore labor. And so that is where a lot of the fears like came in and a lot of like just mind games, you know, during that time, because I was like, oh my word, maybe my body is broken. Like maybe I can't, maybe I can't do this. A little while later, oh, they put in the cook catheter. Um, I dilated and then I was at a five or a six when they checked me, which was awesome. And the baby's head was sitting low. I was 90% effaced. And so that was when like all the happy tears like came. I cried so much during like this whole process. So that was like so encouraging and exciting because I felt like, okay, like this, this is going to happen. And then they broke my water and I reached down kind of over my pubic bone and I realized there was like a bump and I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's the head, like baby is coming down. And so I called the doctor and she checked me and she was like, like, it's time to push. And I was like, wait, like, I was literally like, what? Like, we're doing this. And she was like, yeah, we're doing this. So that was like, so exciting to be like, okay, we're here. But like literally in the back of my mind this whole time, it was like, but what if they tell me to stop? They told me, they said, because they were kind of treating me like a first time, like mom, like having, you know, a natural birth. Um, they said it could take up to two hours. And I think it took like 20 minutes maybe. Cause like, I was just like, we're doing this. So yeah. And then I remember at one point they said, okay, the head is like there. Like, do you want to feel the head? And I'm like, heck yeah, I do. So I got to like reach down and feel the top. And I was just like, oh, okay, like a couple more pushes. And then we didn't know, we didn't find out if we were having a boy or a girl. Um, so it was kind of like a big moment. One more, you know, hard push and he came out and it was a boy, which is super exciting because we had two girls. So yeah, it was just, it truly was magical and just such a surreal moment. So for anyone that's watching and they are either, you know, a first time mom afraid to kind of stand up or really know they really want something for their birth, but you know, we're kind of, you know, in the place where they're like, I don't know if I should say something. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them to encourage them to stand up for themselves? One, like I had said, like find a doctor who is 100% supportive. And if you can't find that doctor, you know, you've looked, you've met, you know, with different doctors, um, I would just be okay to like push back and stand up and do your own research, you know, like with the whole glucola thing, that was something that I felt like strongly about. And I knew that there were other options. And that's the thing, know what your options are. Just like with maybe them trying to bully you into having another C-section, do the research, look and see what the percentage is that that actually happens. What are signs, you know, that it could happen, you know, and then talk to your doctor about that and say like, this is what I found can we work on this together? You know, can this be like a partnership, but don't be afraid. You know, doctors are very smart, but sometimes they're just so by the book that they don't think outside. And so don't be afraid to just suggest things and, and stick to what you, your gut and what you feel, you know, is good for both you and baby. And I think hearing your story alone will just help so many more moms like speak up for themselves mm -hmm. too, because it shows like, you knew what you wanted. You did the research. You found your doctor. And then you had this amazing moment where mm -hmm. like, everything you dreamed about happened. So, yeah. You know, obviously my, my fear was to like having that actual, another C-section again. But in my mind, I was like, you know what, if I do everything in my, that I know in my power to have this be back and still end up with a C-section, I will still it would be obviously hard, but I would still feel good about knowing that I did everything that I could, mm -hmm. you know, that I knew in my power, I found the right doctor. I stood up for what, you know, I wanted and what, you know, was best for us. So yeah, just encouraging people that even if you don't get that birth story that you want, at least you did everything and there's no, like, there's no regret. So I always like to end my interviews with, I call them like fun thinking questions, kind of gets perspective of each mom I interview. So my first question is, if you could have a billboard made today 
where you could share one tip with moms everywhere, what would you have it say? So I like this one. So I did motherhood is both hard and beautiful. And I, what I mean by that is you can still be sleep deprived and want your child to sleep. And you know, it's hard. It is so hard, especially those newborn stages, but then you can also have joy and be so grateful. And it, it there's, it's so beautiful. And I think sometimes we feel like bad or guilty when we're like, I just want this season to end and it's okay to think that, but also find the beauty in it as well. Mm-hmm. I love that. And that's awesome. And what is a quote that you either live by or think of often that either helps you with parenting or just kind of life in general. You know what? I didn't like, I honestly don't have a quote. (laughs) No, I was looking through these and I was like, Oh, I need to like go find a quote, but you know what? I'm just going to be honest. I don't have a quote. I'm not one of those quote people. So that's, no, that's that's fine because that shows, that shows you. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I could one. probably have found one ahead of time, but I'm just no. going to be real. <laughs> no, I think that's, no, that's awesome. So, yeah. and then I know you kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, you do gluten-free nutrition and uh, mm-hmm. you have a really awesome page. So can you talk a little bit uh, briefly about that and then where everyone can find you on social? So I'm a nutritionist. I work one-on-one with clients and I just have a passion to make nutrition just simple, easy, and delicious. Sometimes we, you know, we overcomplicate it. And so I just want to make it simple and, you know, available to everyone and just go back to the basics. I do coaching, one-on-one coaching. I have meal plans that are gluten-free, mostly dairy-free, just to make that easy for people, you know, to, to change their nutrition. I do different challenges and things like that too. But yeah, I share a ton of nutrition tips um, and recipes on um, Instagram. My handle is at Kara Swanson. Um, And then my blogs and all the recipes too are on um, lifewelllive.fitness. Awesome. I'll go ahead and uh, link those at the bottom as well. So everyone can take a look at that. Yeah. So there's a common theme that we see a lot in our mom talk interviews, and that's do the research and know you have other options and stand up for yourself. And I think Kara just emulated that perfectly. She did the research. She knew that what one doctor said wasn't the only way to go. So she did her research. She knew she had other options. And I just think it was such an empowering episode. So right, guys, it's time for our mom tales of the week. This week we said, pick a celebrity mom, real or fictional, who you relate to the most and why. I cannot wait to read these because this is just one of those fun questions because I think when we're watching TV like or movies, we see ourselves in different characters. So I'm just so curious to see who our audience sees as um, their uh, fictional mom. All right, here we go. Okay, number one. It's an Instagram name. A beautiful bee feeding. All right. I relate to Rachel from Friends. Oh, yeah especially when she sings Baby Got Back, just to make Emma laugh. You really do like big butts, don't you? You beautiful little weirdo. Because we literally do anything to get our babies to smile or sleep. I love that episode because, I mean, it's true. When you get to that point where you just need your baby to sleep, you're going to be pulling all the tricks out of the hat. And I just love that once she starts doing it, then Ross kind of realizes, like, just about the singing the song. So um, I love that episode. I'm a huge Friends fan if you didn't know already. Okay, number two, Lynn H. I would say Molly Weasley from Harry Potter. Since the beginning, she was always looking out for her kids while acting as a mother figure to Harry as well. I especially love the scenes where Ron and Harry would get into trouble and she would yell at Ron but still think Harry's a perfect angel. Oh my gosh, I can hear that scene in my head where they snuck out to get the flying car or to pick up Harry and they come back and she starts screaming at them. But then she's like, oh, hello, Harry. And she's like so sweet with him. That's when, oh, that's when like the letter shows up in the school. Okay, now I'm like nerding out because I love the Harry Potter movies. Yeah, that's a good one. And she's so, she's so motherly and like sweet, but like you said in the same way where it's someone you trust, but she also like is very strict. You respect her as a mom. So that's a, that's a really good one. All right. Number three, Mandy R. This may be controversial, but Snooki from Jersey Shore. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I grew up watching Jersey Shore and can relate to Snooki's party days, but see on social media now how great and supportive of of a mom she is. 
you can tell how much she loves being a mom. You know what, that's so true because people know of her as this party girl, so they hear Snooki and they laugh, kind of like what I did. But I have seen a lot of her posts and videos now as a mom, and I think it's really sweet and endearing. And she's very honest and vulnerable, which I think we need to see more of because like, there's so many people that we see kind of become a mom, but we don't see the full transition. We just kind of see them become this mom and they kind of hide, you know, the hard parts or the vulnerable parts. And I think we need to see more of that because a lot of times when people are moved into the motherhood role, we don't really see the hard parts or the parts that they need to be more vulnerable. And so I've noticed this with, with Snooki is that she does show those parts where she's like, this is really hard or I'm doing this. And people are mean, people are kind of vicious online. And I think it's a testament to how much we need to be supporting each other. That whether someone is a celebrity or they became famous on a reality show or they're your next door neighbor, they need support in different ways. And so I think you made a really, really good point here because we do kind of see her journey as she evolves as a, not only a mom, but as a person. So it's a great, great one. Okay, number four, Taylor V. I guess this isn't technically a mom, but I can relate to Nani's character in Lilo and Snitch. Growing up, I hope I pronounced that right because I have not seen this movie, I know. Growing up, my sister and I didn't really have our parents in our lives. I was the one who took care of her and made sure she had a good upbringing. She was significantly younger than me, which caused me to take on more motherly role. I'm really proud of where we've come and relate to Nani because you can see she has such a love for Lilo but acts more as a motherly figure rather than a sister. I think that's really sweet. I have not, I mean, I saw maybe parts of the movie years ago, but I've never seen it from start to finish. So I don't, I'm not super familiar with the characters, but I think that's perfect because it doesn't have to be that exact mom on a show. It's a person that you relate to. And I think that sounds so in tune with what you are used to and what you grew up with. So that's a really cool one. Um, okay, number five, Hillary H. I love Sandra Bullock's character in The Blind Side. While I've never been in this situation, I would like to think I would help others in any way I can. The way she saw that Michael was struggling and the way she took him in as her, her own is so inspiring. I try when I can, but I really look up to that character. She is truly a boss mom. That is a great movie. I love that movie. And I thought the same thing while watching it. Like, man, you how selfless you have to be to bring someone new into your family and it's not you know it's it's different than you know adopting I mean it's a form of adoption in some way but this was a teenager I mean a grown teenager and so and that's based on a true story and so um if you haven't you know seen that story too I would definitely watch the videos that her character is based on because it's a, a true story and I think it's amazing how selfless and, I mean, inspiring she really is. So that's really cool. All right, number six, Mary T. Claire Dunphy from Modern Family. Yes, uh, she's probably one of my favorite moms on TV of all time. She's a perfectionist and a little uptight and can be bossy, which I can relate to, LOL. My husband is also a lot like Phil. Show is more laid back and funny. I love it because it's, I mean, it's one of my favorite shows. If you have not watched Modern Family, go back and watch all of them. It's such a like honest, funny, and realistic show. I mean, there's so many aspects to it. Of course, there's like the kooky humor stuff that isn't very realistic, but you know, you gotta have that for TV. But there's so many things in it that's relatable. I think they do a really good job of like emulating in it. And the dynamic with Claire and Phil, it's hilarious because yeah, she's definitely the more, little more uptight and he's like just goofy. He's kind of like, I don't even know, like another kid or something, just how goofy he is. But I love the show. I think that's, that's really funny. All right. These are awesome responses. As always, we have a new question and every single Friday we'll share it on our social media just to get your take on motherhood. And, uh, you guys never let us down. These are 
awesome responses. So thanks everyone for responding and I will see you next week for a new episode. Hey guys, if you found this or any episode of Mom Talks with Krista helpful, please like, comment, subscribe, and of course, share it with your friends. We release new videos every single Wednesday and our new podcast is out every single Thursday. So lots of different ways you can catch us. And of course, if you're not following us on our socials, go ahead and follow us there. We've got tons of new content for you every single day. And finally, if you're watching this and doubting yourself, you're doing a great job. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next week.